So I welcome one and all for this very, very important and conceptual class today. Um, the thing about uh, today's class is that I'm going to be discussing CTG. And this is not in connection with the CTG that you must be knowing before. Uh, this is a new uh, category of CTG, which has been recently uh, announced by the NICE guidelines. As you can see over there, it's written. The guidelines are published recently in December 22. And it's a very high chance that this is going to be asked in your examinations along with OSCE. So this is a very important and otherwise also, so you should know the importance of uh, CTG and what you're going to do if any of these conditions, they do arise when I'm going to be discussing with you in the class. Uh, the other very important thing about uh, CTG is that the previous CTG guidelines to the current CTG guidelines, you should know the difference between them. And if you do know, you know, the earlier way, you know, of uh, classifying as reassuring, non-reassuring, and abnormal okay reassuring non-reassuring abnormal these were the features you used to find first of all that conceptual thing should be there in your mind these were the features you used to find in the ctg okay that the ctg is well it was normal ctg is reassuring or ctg is abnormal okay so it's reassuring non-reassuring and abnormal okay and then you categorized it into the category of ctg that means whether it's a normal ctg it's a suspicious ctg or it's a pathological CTG. So normal, suspicious, and pathological, they st still do remain. The categories, they still do remain. But these, uh, you know, terminology of the features of the CTG, they have been replaced by now white, amber, and red by the latest NICE guidelines. And with this concept, we move forward in today's class. Uh, so first of all, we perform an Initial C. Very important in the uh, you know labor room is to understand whether this patient needs continuous CTG management or this patient needs just intermittent auscultation, right? So if uh, she's a young primary gravida with no high risk factors, she can be put on intermittent aus auscultation during the first and second stage of labor, right? But if she's a high risk candidate, maybe an IVF conceived pregnancy or an elderly primary gravida or a patient with one of the many confounding factors like, you know, preeclampsia, severe preeclampsia, IUGR, and I'll be discussing the list is there to come. This is, a uh, you know, for the obstetrician to kind of uh, understand whether, uh, you know, this patient needs continuous assessment or she needs, uh, you know, just intermittent auscultation. And before we move further, please quickly write down in the chat box uh, whether you can hear my voice properly and you can see the screen properly. Quickly, guys, because uh, we need to discuss a lot about CTG and I need to know whether we have this, um, whether you can see everything and you can also hear my voice properly. So, all right, okay. And with this, you'll also be able to understand how to reach my telegram, right? So, I just request you all to just quickly write down in the chat whether you can hear my voice. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Move forward. And you can see the screen also, I hope, right? Moving forward. So this is just a quick initial assessment of every patient wheeled in your labor room you need to do to uh, assess what? The antelatal risk factors for any kind of fetal compromise because of any maternal condition or fetal condition to understand whether this patient needs intense monitoring or she can e e easily be dealt with intermittent phosphorylation. And what are those guidelines? Even for that, we have a few important things in the guidelines. So, um, indications for continuous CTG monitoring. See, oh, this is just look at this. Okay, this is one slide. Two, three, four, five. You know, almost five slides are there. And how much I'm going to remember? So, I've just made a very fundamental understanding for this. That any condition that you've read so far, you know, high risk obstetrics, you you all know. So any condition which, you know, causes a fetal uh, compromise in the sense that fetus can go in distress for this patient, that condition, that condition is going to be taken into account as a condition which will prompt you for continuous CTG monitoring in labor. Okay. So amongst which I'll quickly just read one, you'll be able to understand it yourself. See. Previous cesarean birth or any full thickness uterine scar. What are we scared of over here? We are scared of uterine, uh, uterine rupture and sudden, you know, fetal distress. So, see, we are concerned about uterine dehiscence, uterine rupture. 
and uterine rupture and uterine dehiscence how will it reflect it will reflect by fetal distress which will be seen in ctg the first thing which we can pick up over here is the least amount of fetal distress and that prompts us into thinking whether patient is doing all right or there is actually a scar dehiscence so anything which will reach to the fetus right in any which way is going to cause a fetal compromise like a previous cesarean birth any hypertensive disorders okay because that causes usually placental insufficiency deranged doppler flows fetal distress at very early labor okay prolonged rupture of membranes we are not concerned if it if the patient is gone into labor herself okay but if the patient has been admitted there has been a prolonged time delay from the rupture of membranes to the onset of labor she is not yet into labor and you induced labor you know and then you are monitoring her well this is a patient who has a very high chance of developing Choreoamnionitis, which will reflect onto the fetus. Any vaginal blood loss, which is very obvious. Suspected choreoamnionitis. I already told you. Pre-existing diabetes because diabetic females have respiratory distress syndrome in their babies. Okay, and that will reflect as a fetal distress. So all those conditions that you know already in high risk obstetrics. Just remember those chapters that you've read. And every chapter will automatically make a condition for you. Okay, so diabetes mellitus, hypertension uncontrolled, uh, IUG, uh, IUG is also going, also going to come very soon. Choreoamnionitis, so all these things are risk factors and one of the indications for continuous CTG monitoring. Offer continuous CTG monitoring for women in labor who have any of the following, especially non-cephalic presentations, because such case of such presentations usually they are responsible for either cord prolapse or you know placental, uh, uh, you know. We, we call it the the pull or the push on the placenta okay the head is like pushing on the placenta especially at the time of the second stage of labor anyways that remember non-cephalic presentations fetal growth restriction like i told you even small for gestational age babies they seem to have some amount of you know uh, a compromise especially during labor polyhydramnios especially oligohydramnios not anhydramnios but definitely oligohydramnios Okay, reduced fetal movements which are already there at the start of the, all these are high risk statements, right? Contractions. Now we come to very important new intrapartum risk factors which are in which you can offer continuous CTG. Right now we're just talking about those conditions in which you can offer continuous CTG monitoring, right? So contractions which last longer than two minutes or there are more than five contractions in 10 minutes. If there is already a presence of meconium in early phase of labor. The patient is has he, having maternal pyrexia. The patient is having pyrexia fever. Suspected choreoamnionitis or suspected sepsis. Okay. And uh, any kind of pain which was not the kind of pain she experienced at the previous labor. Okay. So you're already thinking of protracted labor or bandages ring or whatever. You know, this happened with me as well. I, in the labor room, there was a patient who was already a third gravid and she was shouting like you know as if she's this is the first time she's having labor very very you know and i was a resident at that time and my uh, consultant she came into the labor room and she was drawn towards the place where i had taken her inside and she was seeing me you know very nervous with the patient she asked me what happened i said she's just shouting as if you know it's not even the you know first time she's a new beginner for you know all these things and the way she's behaving is very strange so she said you know what she examined her a little bit and then she said i'll take her up for c-section immediately the decision was taken the relatives were called they said yes okay and she finally delivered and later on my consultant told me that maybe it was early start of bandels ring formation or uh, some protracted course of labor which we cannot pinpoint to but it is always good of practice to let your concerned you know uh, authority or obstetrician know what is the condition of the patient and she, she's behaving in any which erratic way so every you know the the labor was going smooth she was dilating absolutely fine fetal heart was also all right but the way she was shouting was far more exaggerated than even a normal you know primary gravida gravida is going to shout in the first stage of labor so that was the thing which prompted her to take this step so even any pain which is much more than the pain usually that is seen in the new uh, in the uh, a different kind of pain or she's you know behaving very different from it was the, uh, the, the scene in before fresh vaginal bleeding if, de if it develops in the labor it's not show sometimes placenta is a little low lying okay and it when it when is there's shearing force because the lower segment stretching away there's more of bleeding so it's always be very very prompt then see maternal pulse going high all these conditions will not come into your mind until you at least read them once 
blood stained lichen very important not associated with if you've done vaginal examination and suddenly there's a gush of uh, amniotic fluid fine then it will be blood stained but suddenly without any provoking factors if there suddenly there's you know the Uh, there is rupture of membrane with blood stain discharge and this blood is coming for some time more and it's not the normal blood that you usually see the streak of blood or something you should be prompted into taking it seriously then severe hypertension that means either systolic is more than 160 or see i have highlighted it or diastolic is more than 110 okay so maybe it's 140 110 but again you should be prompted into taking a decision for this patient never shy away from intensively monitoring a patient right because the other way round is even worse hypertension on you know um, what what is this either systolic blood pressure 140 or more or diastolic blood pressure 90 more or two consecutive readings taken 30 minutes apart that's the usual definition of hypertension but even such patients a reading of 2 plus urine on urine analysis and one of these things either the systolic blood pressure is more than 140 c there is even a patient who's come to you with 140 90 blood pressure would you not go for continuous monitoring for her while well, you would because most of them have proteinuria and proteinuria in such a patient is usually more than or equal to 2 plus so such patient again becomes very very important and there or there is a confirmed delay in first stage or second stage or there has been an epidural inserted or you've been using uh, oxytocin which you usually use all your patients becomes the category for continuous ctg monitoring but everywhere you do not have resources for that because of which this kind of recommendations keep coming in that which patients should you actually monitor so intensively and which patients can you think of going ahead with intermittent auscultation